Sounds good. All right. Well, welcome back, everybody. And it's time for episode four of Bible study, Bible diving. Um, and I'm excited. And I'll just go ahead and let you know that I feel like a lot of life has happened between this month and, and March. At least that's the way it's been in my house. So uh, we're going to get started first with some prayer and then some quick review just to kind of get us all back in the groove again. And then we're going to dive into the Gospels tonight, which I'm really excited about. So let me pray for us and uh, then we'll get started. And so please join me in prayer. Lord, we come to you and we come to your word again tonight, seeking your face, seeking your heart and wanting to have the mind of Christ, Lord. So as we come and we read your word together, Lord, and we talk about the ways that you have uniquely designed and crafted it, Lord, um, how you entered time and space and you came to speak in human languages, Lord. You didn't require us to learn some heavenly angelic language to hear your voice, but you have come so far to make yourself known. And your word says that if we seek you, we will find you. And so, Lord, we come seeking you tonight above all else. I pray, Lord, that you would open up our minds and our hearts to whatever it is you have to say to us. Um, Lord, as we continue to train and to stretch our skills um, so that we can dive deeper into your word. I pray for all of us tonight, Lord God, that, that we would see you more than anyone else, but you would encourage us through one another. And we dedicate this time to your glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, let me go ahead and start with a presentation. I'm going Thank to... A second. Hi. Yes. Debbie's having a hard time signing in. She's typed in the password and everything, and she's not being able to get uh, logged in. Okay, so she may need to, I'm, I'm going to let Kanisha handle that. Uh, yeah. Okay, she's going to try to do it on her iPad. Okay. Okay. And I'll call her. Tell her I'll call her. Okay. All right. She, uh, All right. Kanisha's going to call you. All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my okay. screen. I'm going to let Kanisha call you. Yeah. Okay. Bye. Thanks, Marianne. If you go ahead and mute, unless you're going to be asking a question, that's for everybody. That okay. Way you're here um, recording. Okay. Let me mute this. Awesome. All right. Give me a thumbs up if you can see my screen. Sweet. Nice. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do a real quick review into um, what Bible diving is. You know, we've said this, this will be the fourth time through and hopefully we'll be able to kind of get into this rhythm and this will start to become more automatic the more often that we do this, the more often that we practice. But God's word is all about Jesus. It is the word made flesh. We, uh, it is designed to discern the thoughts and intentions of the heart not just the mind. It's not just an intellectual exercise. God is after the thoughts and intentions of our innermost being, according to Hebrews 4.12. And it is written for us, but not to us. God did enter time and space to a specific people in a specific language through a specific author in order to communicate what he wants to communicate. And so context really, really matters. When we're talking about Bible diving, we're talking about properly interpreting the scriptures. A couple of really big questions we're always going to ask of every passage, no matter what kind of literature it is, no matter where we are in the scriptures, we want to know where is this passage in the big story of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And we also want to keep in mind the covenants that God has made with his people to this point. We spent a lot of time on that. In uh, session three, I would encourage you to go back and look at those slides and those notes if you want to review um, where, you know, some of that meta narrative and some of those things. We talked uh, last time, we talked about going through Old Testament narratives and we went through the story of Samson. Uh, we have lots of different kinds of literature in the Bible. 
This time, we're going to actually look at New Testament narrative in the form of the Gospels. And the Gospels have certain interesting characteristics that make them a little bit different from other narratives. Um, the Gospels comprise the majority of the narrative in the New Testament. The book of Acts is where you're going to find the rest of it. Um, so some of the rules that we talked about in session three will definitely apply to the New Testament narrative. And then there's some additional layers on top of that. So let's jump into what the Gospels have for us. Um, first of all, let's just define what gospel is. What is a gospel? Now, we tend to think of the gospel exclusively in terms of Christianity because that's the way our culture uses this word primarily. You might see some other kind of, kind of plays on words, you know, the gospel according to Mark Twain or something interesting like that. But gospel literally is from the Greek word uh, euangelion, excuse me, euangelion is the Greek word. The English word is a shortened version of God spell, uh, which is God's message. So that's where the English word comes from. The Greek word, as it shows up in the New Testament, is euangelion, euangelion, which means good message or good news. Now, it is not a word that is unique to Christianity. This was a word that was around for quite some time before Jesus ever came on the scene. Before the gospels were ever written, the term gospel was already in the culture and it was used to, um, to represent like when the king, when, when, the, when the, a nation was in, at, at war and they went out and they won the war, then the king wanted to spread the good news that, the, that they were victorious throughout the realm. They would send out heralds with the gospel of the good news of victory. Another time that the gospel would go out from a royal decree was when a new a prince was born, a new king was born, or when a new king took ascended to the throne. So in its most technical form, euangelion, I'm having a hard time saying that tonight. I don't know why. You see the word, there it is. Um, it's a royal announcement of victory or the ascension of a new king. Now there's a really great video. There's a word study on this at the Bible Project. I have a link to it here. I'll post it in band after we, we get here. But when you, when you start to think about, okay, so now we have the gospel of Jesus Christ, automatically in the culture in which that comes, as soon as that word is said, they're thinking royal decree king and kingdom. And so there is no way to separate the gospel from the kingdom of God. They are inherently together. It isn't just about salvation. It isn't just about sacrifice and resurrection. It is about the kingdom of God coming to earth. And we have to keep that in mind. That is the fundamental definition of the gospel, which means as we're thinking about kingdom with the kingdom of God, we have to keep have that concept in mind as we're reading through the gospels. We're going to get into that a little bit more as we get into some of the Bible diving itself. So we have four gospels, four accounts of the kingdom of God invading earth as Jesus comes to be born as a baby, to live on earth, to teach to do miracles, to die, and to be raised to life again. And this is how the kingdom of God is coming to earth. Now, these aren't, um, these are four accounts of the same events, but it's like looking at a prism from different angles. It's the same thing, but from a different perspective. And so as you're looking at Matthew, you're going to notice that it's a different perspective with a different emphasis with certain things sort of really brought and highlighted and other things sort of selectively left out because Matthew has a certain purpose and a certain audience he's talking to, even though it's the same thing. If you turn the prism to Mark, it's going to be a little bit different. It's going to refract that message a little bit differently. 
Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in the four gospels, four different authors with four different audiences and four different reasons for writing their gospels. So it's really important as we're looking at the gospel narratives to know who's my author, why did they write this? What is the primary purpose? What are the, what's the point they're trying to make? What's the aspect of Jesus' earthly ministry, the kingdom of God that they're trying to emphasize? And why does this particular audience need it? That's going to help us stay on track with being very careful with our interpretation and correctly interpreting the gospel narratives as we look at that. Now, as if I go too fast, raise your hand, put something in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on it, but we good so far? Woohoo! All right, awesome. Let's take these. The first, the first reason. I'm I sorry. Reason. Debbie, I think you've got your. Um, I think you're not muted right now. So. Thank you. All right, so let's start with the Gospel of Mark. And the reason I'm starting there instead of with Matthew's gospel is because most scholars believe that the gospel of Mark was the first one that was written. It's the earliest of the four gospels. It was probably written around 65 AD, which would be about 30 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it shows up among the Roman Christians shortly after the apostle Peter is martyred. So the best knowledge that we have, and, and nothing is completely certain because we're talking about you know 2000 years ago, it's really hard to pin some of these things down. But most scholars agree that it was most likely written by John Mark. John Mark is someone that we see mentioned in Acts chapter 12. And again, in 1 Peter 5, 13, he was known to be accompanying Peter in his ministry. And so Mark's gospel is an account of the earthly life of Jesus as it was told by Peter, as it was taught to John Mark by Peter through retelling of those stories and through retelling of the teachings of Jesus. Uh, there are some scholars who believe that in one of the accounts of the arrest of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, you may recall that one disciple kind of hung around and then he was about to get caught and he ran away and somebody grabbed his cloak and he accidentally ran away naked. You remember this guy? A lot of people think that's John Mark. That detail is only included in Mark's gospel. And unless you're that person, it's hard to know <laughs> that happened. So. The gospel of Mark as the earliest one and written to a Roman culture, it tends to be very fast paced, very action oriented. It's relatively short and it just goes boom, 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 one thing next to, the, to another. It doesn't have a lot of detail in it. Again, a lot of Jewish literature doesn't contain a lot of the visual details that we like, but what it does include is very intentional. And so we want to pay attention to what's there and Mark tends to emphasize the power of God because he's writing to a group of Christians in Rome who are under persecution. And if you can imagine, the Apostle Peter has just been martyred. There have been several Christian martyrs. This is kind of around that time where Nero has come to power in that 60, 70 AD period. Um, it's 70 AD, the temple in Jerusalem is going to be destroyed. So there's a whole lot of nastiness going on around Christianity and Judaism at this time. And it is so important for those Christians in Rome to know who the true king is, who the, the, that the kingdom that they live in now is not the real true king or the true kingdom that the Messiah has come. And he is powerful. He's more powerful than even Rome. So the summary of all of that the Gospel of Mark was written by a Jew to a believing Gentile audience under persecution to emphasize the power of Jesus as the Messiah and the true King. So that's what we want to keep in mind when we're reading Mark's Gospel. Sound good? Awesome. Okay. 
I'm just going to double check the chat because I'm always, where do we get the idea of a synoptic gospel? Okay, so the three gospels that are synoptic, and I'm about to get to this, are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they agree with each other. And the reason for that I'm just about to get to is since Mark's gospel was first, Matthew and Luke both had access to it and based their gospels on Mark's writing and then expanded on them. So they are synoptic in that as a synopsis, they agree. And then John is the outlier that seems to have been written completely independently. So you're gonna find the sequence of events and even some of the phrasing very, very similar from Mark to Matthew and from Mark to Luke, but Matthew has a different purpose. And then we'll add in certain details that helps him make his point, which we're going to get to in just a minute. And then Luke does the same thing. But you can even look at certain, um, if, you, if you have a harmony of the gospels, and I'll show you in Blue Letter Bible where to find that, you can look at the, like the same account side by side and even see how similar those three gospels are compared to John. And we're going to see that tonight when we actually get into some of the scriptures. So the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark is the earliest. Matthew and Luke base their material off of Mark's gospel, which is already being circulated. So let's look at Matthew. The gospel of Matthew was written later than Mark, obviously. If it's based on Mark, then it has to be written later. And it was written by Matthew, the former tax collector and one of Jesus' 12 disciples, who is also known by his Hebrew name, Levi. So Matthew is his Greek name. Levi is his Hebrew name. A lot of folks in this first century had two names, a Hebrew name and a Greek name. Um, now, it's interesting that Matthew only refers to himself by his Greek name, but Mark and Luke will refer to Matthew as Levi. It's the same person. It's the same person. So I want you to know that. Now, Matthew wants to convince his fellow Jews that Jesus is, in fact, the promised Messiah who fulfills Old Testament prophecies. Matthew also tends to focus on the negative aspects of Judaism as it was practiced in his time. And as a former tax collector who was the brunt of a lot of criticism from the Jewish scribes and Pharisees, you might understand why. So God's using his personality, using Matthew's unique position in order to, to elevate some critique of the way the Jews were practicing religion in the first century. Uh, Jesus had some pretty harsh things to say as well, and Matthew will have a tendency to highlight that. What you're going to see in the book of Matthew is Matthew's going to quote Old Testament prophecy a lot. He's often referred to as the bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. That's why he's located first in the New Testament, because he's going to such great lengths to prove that Jesus fulfills the Old Testament prophecies. It's also why he's very careful with his genealogy at the very beginning of Matthew to prove that Jesus comes from the right family line, that he fulfills, you know, the Davidic covenant and can be the true king that was promised, you know, to the King David, the one that will reign on his throne forever, the descendant of Judah, so on and so forth. So in summary of that, we have the Gospel of Matthew written by a Jew to a Jewish audience to emphasize that Jesus is the promised Messiah and King that the Old Testament scriptures describe. That's Matthew's primary goal. Sound good? So that's the second of the synoptic gospels. Our favorite guy, Luke, and we tend to really like Luke in our culture because he organizes things the way we like it because he is a Gentile and a Greek trained, educated man who puts in the kinds of details that we like and he really likes chronological order and all of these things that we're a lot more familiar with. Luke also uh, tended to rely not only on Mark's gospel, but also uh, traditionally is understood to have interviewed a lot of eyewitnesses, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and others in order to get some of the details like about 
some of the details surrounding the birth of Christ, the reason we read Luke 2 every Christmas. Luke was the one who did the investigation to get that kind of historical record. Now, he his basis is Mark's gospel, um, and he is a Gentile Greek physician who met Paul during his second missionary journey, probably in the city of Troas, right around in there. And he's, he gives us a really clear statement of right up front about why he's writing this gospel. And isn't that nice of him? He says he's writing to Theophilus. We have no idea who that is, but it might be somebody who is wealthy and sponsored Luke's writing of the gospel. This was not a cheap endeavor. This was not easy. He needed a sponsor probably for the kind of work that he did. Um, or it could just be a generic term that means lover of God, and it could be addressed to any believer. You'll see commentaries debate. The general consensus is that it really was a person named Theophilus. Luke refers to him as most excellent Theophilus, so it's probably someone of standing, perhaps even nobility, using that kind of a phrase. And Luke says, it seemed good to me also, having followed all things closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. And so the Gospel of Luke is actually the Gospel of Luke part one. Acts, the book of Acts, is the Gospel of Luke part two. Both of those are, it's just a continuation. Acts is simply a continuation of the Gospel of Luke, both written by the same man. Um, so in summary, the Gospel of Luke was written by a Gentile to a believing Gentile audience, non-Jewish, as well as to believing Jews. He knew others would read this to emphasize that Jesus is the savior of the whole world. And what makes Luke's gospel so lovely is because he's not writing to primarily a Jewish audience, he'll go to a little more trouble to explain some things that aren't obvious to us non-Jews. So Luke tends to be a lot of people's favorite gospel for that reason. But he does have a very specific purpose that's different from Matthew and Mark. And so those are the three synoptic gospels. And then you have John. And if you've ever read the Gospel of John, then you, you already know that it's just different. That John just approached the whole thing in a completely different way. He did not base his Gospel writing on the Gospel of Mark. He decided to take a completely different approach. Now, most people do think it was written by the Apostle John, although this is the one that's most hotly debated. There are a couple of other Johns that are mentioned in scripture that some people think, well, maybe the gospel of John was written by this John and John's letters were written by another John and the book of Revelation was written by yet another John. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff. I tend to think it's the apostle John and the majority of people and tradition holds the community of faith tends to hold that it was written by the apostle John, who was one of the twelve. Um, it was the latest of the three Gospels, so it was written after the fall of the temple in 70 AD. It was at earliest 85 AD, somewhere between 85 and 95 AD towards the end of John's life at about the same time that the book of Revelation was written. John is emphasizing the unity of Jesus as the Son of God with the Father. So he also is kind enough to give us a verse that tells us exactly why he's writing this gospel. It's in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. He says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so John is openly admitting right here off the top that he has selected certain miracles. This is not an exhaustive account of Jesus' life. None of the gospels are, but he has selected certain things that he believes will help people believe that Jesus Christ is 
the son of God. And by believing in him, you will have life. And so the way John has organized his gospel is that he has selected seven miracles in particular, along with particular teachings, but he's ordered the gospel around these seven miracles that, that begin with the water to wine at the wedding in Cana and go through increasing levels of power in the mind, all the way through of Lazarus. And then we have the crucifixion and his own resurrection as a separate eight account. So John is organizing his gospel around these seven miracles of increasing power. And he's building a case one by one by one that Jesus is who he says he is. It's in the gospel of John. You're going to find the I am statements of Jesus. I am the light. I am the bread of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. These I am statements are intentional to connect him to the I am, the great I am, Yahweh. John is going to great lengths to make the point that Jesus is one with God. He is God and he has the power of God. And so the gospel of John is written by a Jew to Jewish believers in the Greco-Roman world probably in the area of Ephesus, because that's where John was living at the time, in order to encourage them in a time of persecution and opposition. There was a great deal of, I mean, John was thrown on the island of Patmos, all the other things that were going on. So this was also written at a time of persecution and opposition that had begun way back in like the mid 60s around Nero, and it had still continued um, through those generations to that day. How are we doing? Any questions so far? Got the chat up. Any questions so far? Are we doing good? All right, we're even on schedule. Okay, so let's take, before we actually dive into the gospels themselves, let's, there are a few things to keep in mind as we're gonna take a look at one gospel story that appears in all four gospels. Um, so a few things to keep in mind. What is the author's purpose? in this particular writing. We're gonna compare and see how that purpose shows up in the details that were selected and the details that were left out by each author. Um, and then also the gospel is all about the kingdom of God. So how, how does this passage tell us what the kingdom of God is and what is its impact on the world? Now we know as believers that we are living in this tension where the kingdom of God has come because Jesus has come but it's not fully realized yet. There's an already but not yet tension that we are living in. And so the gospels start to unpack this. How is the kingdom of God already but not yet in this passage is one of the questions you wanna ask when you're taking a look at a gospel narrative. So with that, let's take a look at the story of the resurrection. This ought to be fresh in everybody's mind. We just had Easter a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it is one of the accounts that is in all four of the scriptures, all four of the gospels. And so we're going to start with Matthew. And I'm going to go ahead and stop screen sharing so I can see all of your lovely faces. Um, but we're going to start in the gospel of Matthew in chapter 28, verses one through 10. Now, before we read this, I'm gonna ask somebody to read that. So you guys can go ahead and be flipping through your Bibles and try to find that for me. Um, before we read that, let's just remind ourselves who Matthew is writing to and what is his point? Who took good notes? What was the scripture again, Kat? Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. So who is Matthew, first of all? Tax collector. Tax collector. One of Jewish. the 12. Hmm? Jewish and kind of seen poorly from the Jewish people because of his role in collecting taxes and how they kind of had a bad reputation as being corrupt and they weren't, they weren't the favorites. Right. Who is Matthew writing to? The Jews. Jews. Believing Jews. And what is he trying to accomplish with this writing? 
to show that Jesus is the promised Messiah and King described in the scriptures. All right. So with that in mind, would somebody be willing to read those 10 verses, Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 10? Let's see if we can kind of get an idea of how Matthew's approach to this particular account. Who would be willing to do that? I've got it. Go for it. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards, became, the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, do not be afraid. For I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go into Galilee. There they will see me. Okay, so if you are a Jew who is reading this or hearing this read to you for the first time, and you're thinking about, you know, some of those Old Testament things about Mm, you know, we read in Deuteronomy here, O Israel, the Lord, your God is one. You shall worship him only. Remember the 10 commandments and all these other kinds of things. And you're reading this. Are there any things that would um, jump out at you as being really important? That the women are the ones who have, who get to see him first and that they're the ones to sit, tell everyone else that Jesus is risen. Women weren't considered you know, the, the ones to deliver the message, they were second class citizens. Whatever. They weren't considered reliable testimonies. How rude. <laughs> what else? What else stands out to you? Have well, we ever he does. Go ahead. I was going to say he does. He, he's describing. I hadn't really thought about it this way, so I'm trying to look at this with that perspective. He goes into a lot of detail about the angel of the Lord um, being a part of it, and so I'm guessing that would have been something. There's we know there's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament about when the angel of the Lord appears. So maybe that is something that he's trying to um, connect for them. Yeah, angel of the Lord is Old Testament code for presence of God. And it is all over the Old Testament. You've probably seen it many, 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 many times. And you're going to continue to see it as we continue to work through the Psalms and the prophets and over and over and over. Also, it says um, several times, don't be afraid. Because I'm be sure that was quite the sight. <laughs> quite the... Uh, you know, speechless, drop the mic moment. Yeah. If you're not familiar with the prophets yet, you will see that angels are often described by the prophets as having an appearance like lightning with clothes white as snow. That is really Old Testament prophet language right there. There are several cues in here that Jews would pick up on immediately. But I think one of them that is really, really telling is that the women do fall at Jesus' feet and worship him, and they are not rebuked for it. Jesus accepts their worship as God. That would be mind-blowing for a Jew. That would be absolutely mind-blowing. Now, what's going to be interesting here is as we go from here to read the other accounts is to start to think, well, wait, Matthew said this, but Mark said this. So let's go ahead and take a look now 
at the Mark's account of the resurrection in Mark chapter 16, verses 1 through 11. So if Matthew is a Jew writing to a Jewish audience to try to kind of put these Old Testament cues in about, hey, this is Messiah, and he does that all the way through his gospel, let's remind ourselves who Mark is. So who, who do we believe Mark to be, the author of this gospel? John Mark. Mm -hmm. Why would he be writing a gospel? How would he have any, how would he know about Jesus' earthly ministry? From Peter. <clears throat> From Peter. And who is Mark writing to? Believing Gentiles. Hmm? Roman Christians. Yep, yeah, Roman Christians, not Jews. So we have a Jew writing to not Jews, which means we might have some hope of some explanation of some Jewish things along the way, which would be nice. Why is Mark writing his gospel? What do we think the best reason is? Emphasizing the power of God. Emphasizing the power of God. So with that in mind, in contrast to Matthew, would somebody be willing to read chapter 16, verses 1 through 11? Somebody have that? <clears throat> when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Sol Salome bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus's body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, he said. You are looking at Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. When Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. When they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Stop there. Yep. Okay. Same story from a different angle, huh? Okay, so what do you notice about Mark's account? He makes a distinction of the two Marys, uh, Mary Magdalene and then Mary, the mother of James. Mm -hmm. And then he adds in a third. Yeah, Salome. Mm -hmm. And who do we think she is? Another one of the women who followed Jesus and took care of him while he was walking around with his disciples. There were a whole bunch of them. Seems much more detailed. Mm -hmm. So he's the including first, why, why the women brought the spices because a Gentile audience might not do burial that same way. Isn't that it's really nice? interesting that he mentions <clears throat> that Mary Magdalene qualifies her as the woman who had driven out seven demons which you would think if he was trying to set up some sort of convincing narrative he would probably include somebody that had more of a, you know the general audience might not think of that as a reliable or I don't know whatever that would be something they would probably be critical of but I mean it means something different to us because we know it was you know she served him and it was out of gratefulness, but that's an interesting qualifier that he would choose to 
say this isn't just any woman. This is the woman out of whom he drove seven demons. Now, why do you suppose Mark would want to include that little detail? I thought it was because so many of these people were connected to Jesus's family, like James and John, that Mark, since he was kind of outside of that circle, he noticed all the Marys, he noticed all the James, he noticed all the Joneses, and he wanted to make sure that regular Christians who were not part of Jesus's little crew understood who all of these Marys were, because there were, what, five Marys, four Marys? And so I love Mark's because you can, I can kind of tell that he wasn't related to the Lord. He wasn't a cousin. He wasn't a brother. He wasn't a family friend. And so he, it seems to me that he emphasizes things that only people outside of that circle would notice. Like, why are there so many Marys? Yeah. He doesn't make the same kinds of assumptions. Yeah. He doesn't make the same kind of assumptions. But in, in, in specifically, I want to go back to what Ginger was saying about Mary Magdalene, whom he drove out seven demons from Mary, by the way. Um, now, remember, what is Mark's point in writing this gospel? Power of God. Show the power of God. Power. How powerful do you have to be to kick seven demons out of a person? You got to be God himself. You got to be God have the authority. You got to have <laughs> the authority. So it's just another opportunity to show off God's power. What are all the ways that you see God's power being shown off in this short account? You want to just rattle a few of them off? <clears throat> the stone being rolled away for one. And it was very big, he said. Yeah, and specifically made note. <clears throat> was. Yep. Yeah, that's a nice detail that, that along the way they happen to be discussing, oh, I wonder how we'll get the stone away. You know, I'm, I can just see these women going back to the group. And then we were talking about how are we going to get the stone rolled away? And so we were already worried about that. I mean, you can just see that as a conversation that would take place as they're relaying the whole story to him. And then when we got there, it was already gone. And so I, I mean that that make the all these details just make it that much more believable that that we can all imagine ourselves in that situation where if you just told a story like, <clears throat> oh, and and then the angel was there and it was oh you know if it didn't really happen, you wouldn't think to to point that out that there was a giant stone and it was and we were already concerned about it. That's just to me gives it more of a the legitimacy that this is an actual thing that took place and if that's what he was trying to prove then that would be why he would put that in there sure but notice that he also left out a whole lot of things that matthew put in because he's got a whole different agenda well this whole earthquake white you know clothes white like lightning white as snow stuff nobody cares about that we want to know about the power of god yeah. yeah the other thing is that he was on jesus was on his way to galilee right but he the angel remained mm -hmm. in the tomb so he knew that they were coming to check things out and he the angel was there to tell them what was going on yeah so it's just another illustration of his power mm -hmm. all-knowing so yeah. isn't it interesting to compare these side by side and see how two people just looking at it from different angles with a different group in mind and a different emphasis can share very different things, but still be looking at the exact same thing. And isn't it so cool that we have all four of them? What's interesting on uh, verse eight, I have ESV, but it says, um, and they went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they had said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. So the distinction of like the fear actually seized them that shows like the power and the holiness of God. Um, I thought that was kind of interesting how that, you know, they, they focus on that. And then he also said, not just the disciples, but he also said, and Peter. So I'm like curious about that. Like, you know, how he wasn't mixed in with the disciples he said the disciples and peter yeah so if you know peter's story you might wonder okay why might peter not be with the disciples at this particular moment 
Peter had just had a massive failure, had he not? <laughs> but Jesus didn't leave him out. How cool is that? Good stuff. All right. Let's hey, keep Kat, going. Yeah. I noticed in Matthew's account, Jesus was the one speaking to the women. He huh? said, do not be afraid. And he's telling them, you know, go tell my disciples I'm going to meet them. First person. In this account, the young man dressed in white, presumably an angel, is talking to the women and say, don't be afraid. He is going to. So it was a, a second person rather than Jesus speaking to them directly. Was it? Could the young man have been Jesus? And they just didn't recognize him? Well, that did happen elsewhere. Well, it says, and there are there are all those those um, you know theological concept in the Old Testament where people say something was the pre incarnate Christ, and so I suppose there is some possibility that when people thought they were talking to the angel of the Lord, they were talking to Jesus. I don't know. Yeah, we don't That's know. That's interesting. Yeah, Mark's language is vague enough that we could be. One doesn't preclude the other. My study Bible has a note that says that uh, Matthew identified the young man as an angel in Matthew 28, 2. He but was he saying is? an angel of the Lord, but you're saying the angel of the Lord is code for Jesus. It, there are a lot of theologians who do believe that the angel of the Lord, when the angel of the Lord appears in the Old Testament, that's the pre-incarnate Christ. Yeah, 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 it is a theological position. It's not the only one, but it is a theological position that you can justify. But again, not the only one. It's not definitive. Right, but this wouldn't be pre-incarnate. This would be no, but we do have an account, and we're going to read it here in just a minute. We do have an account where the women who go to the tomb see somebody who is Jesus, but they don't recognize him at first. Right. So in my mind, and you can, you know, I'm just thinking that young man could be Jesus. It might be. They just didn't recognize him. And for Mark's purposes, he wasn't really concerned with that. It makes me think also of the story back in Genesis when Jacob wrestled with the angel. And he changed his name to Israel, which means wrestled with God. So going back, what you were saying about how the angel of the Lord could be Jesus. Yep. That is a whole theological thorn bush, which we could totally explore if we had time, but we don't. <laughs> and John, I mean, I know we don't have time, but I'll add this. John, there's two angels. And so it really is different. And you better believe we're, we're going to fly through Luke and we're going to get to John because there's something really cool about that. So let's go ahead and get ourselves to Luke chapter 24. Luke 24 verses 1 through 12. So who is our boy Luke? Who is Luke? Doctor. Nice. Doctor Luke. Dr. Luke, who is he writing to? Gentiles. Gentiles, we like Luke. Why is he writing? To create emphasize an orderly that, account. Yep. And emphasize that Jesus is the savior of the whole world. Yep. Not just the Messiah for the Jews. It's just... Yeah. What do you think of a Gentile writing to Gentiles about a Jewish Messiah? <laughs> that's a good time i think it would, right. allow, it, it would allow for some of the skepticism that the gentiles would have uh it would lessen it because here's the account coming from one of their own mm -hmm. and a doctor right right an educated man who has wasn't an eyewitness himself but was an eyewitness to a lot of paul's ministry uh, deeply invested, interviewed eyewitnesses, put together this very orderly account, you know, all the way through the book of Acts. So we, li we like Luke. Luke is fun. Luke is the easiest one to, for us modern Westerners to grasp. 
who will read um, Luke 24 verses 1 through 12? <clears throat> I can read it. Go for it. Um, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the tomb, bringing the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. They went in, but did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men stood by them in dazzling clothes. So the women were terrified and bowed down to the ground. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? Asked the men. He is not here, but he has risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and rise on the third day. And they remembered his words. Returning from the tomb, they reported all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them were telling the apostles these things. But these words seemed like nonsense to them, and they did not believe the women. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. When, they, when he stooped to look in, he saw only the linen cloths. So he went away amazed at what had happened. Okay, what do you think of Master Luke's account? So now there are two men. <clears throat> right. Well, it's interesting because none of these people, except for maybe John, I don't know, do we know, none of these people were actually there that are writing this. They got the account from somebody else. Mm -hmm. So you know how the whole eyewitness thing of this paper in psychology about eyewitness testimony, right? Mm -hmm. And so they all got their, their information from the same people, and it may have just stood, different things stood out to them, right? And so perhaps... The fact that there were two people wasn't that important to the other people. I don't know. It's just interesting to think about because Luke wasn't there. So he's writing secondhand information based right. on what, and the women were, right? So it's interesting to kind of think about the fact that it's all secondhand. It's close. It's still good, but they just chose to write what they chose to write. Right. And so Luke writing to a, a Gentile audience and being more trained in a Greek minded thought process that's more linear and more detailed like we like it he goes ahead and includes that there are two where Matthew was just like hey angel of the lord is fine that, that makes my point kind of a well deal. in science he's a science person right, right. He's so a science person. details matter yeah, you, you you don't leave stuff out it's it's all observation mm -hmm. I don't know if they had the scientific method back then but maybe they did <laughs> at least the beginnings of it for sure that's what Matthew. Which would be the reason why Luke's account starts off with the day of the week and the time of the morning. Instead <laughs> of where all the other ones like early in the morning or first thing, Luke says, okay, no, on the first day of the week at this hour, this is what they did, what they had with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because He's Matthew charting. and Mark both refer to the Sabbath. They're Jews. Luke is not a Jew. He's not referring to the Sabbath. He's not writing to a Jewish audience. So they wouldn't necessarily understand the Sabbath either. So he doesn't even refer to the Sabbath. So it's really interesting to kind of compare these and kind of see how is Luke making his point that this is an orderly account that gives confidence in what, some, what a Gentile believer has been taught. Yes, they are all telling it from a different perspective. So how has Luke structured this story in order to give believing Gentiles confidence in what they have been thought, what they have been taught? Do you see anything in there that sort of fits that description? When he says to remember how he spoke to you when he was in Galilee, saying it is necessary that the Son of Man be betrayed into the hands of sinful men, be crucified and rise on the third day. Yep. He's giving that level of detail that Gentiles like, isn't he? Like we like. <laughs> For sure. We're very, very short on time. And there's something really, really cool in the Gospel of John in his account that I want to tell you. I want to show you. So let's go ahead and flip on over there. We're going to John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And I'll go ahead and take this one. <clears throat> 
So who is John? Some say the apostle, John. Most likely candidate, for sure. Who is he writing to? Written to Jewish believers. Yeah, Jewish believers who are in the Greco-Roman world around Ephesus, other places around there. And, and what's going on? What is, why might John be writing this gospel? Well, he says why he's writing the gospel. Yeah, because they're encouraging them when they're in the midst of persecution, opposition. Yep. So with that in mind, hear these words. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, code for John, and said, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And they asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you were looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you had carried him away, please tell me where you have put him and I will get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me for I have not yet returned to the father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. John is funny, isn't he? What do, what do you notice about John? Seems like he pulled it all together. All the eyewitnesses. <laughs> yeah, he got the two witnesses. <laughs> you the two You're right. And yeah. he was an eyewitness. So this is great. Apparently there was a foot race and he won. He wanted to make sure everybody knew it. He put that in there three times. <laughs> three <laughs> times to let him know that he was the one that got there first. And he was the one that Jesus loved. Yeah, he was. Right. <laughs> he was the one that Jesus loved. Now there is a detail in here and I'm going to go ahead I, I'm, because it's right now at eight o'clock and I want to honor everyone's time. I'm just going to go ahead and give this to you to let you know the kinds of things that you could be looking for. Remember that John is trying to emphasize that Jesus is one with the Father. He is God. And so you see Jesus' statement, for example, that says, you know, I am going to the Father, to my Father and your Father, my God and your God. I mean, that is a statement that only John includes. The other thing that John does is he takes note of the actual position of the angels, one where the head would have been and one where the feet would have been. And then both Peter and John <clears throat> see the linens in between that are laid out and those linens, can you imagine what would those linens have looked like? Just picture it in your mind. Chapter 20. On the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the <laughs> What would those linens have looked like? Bloody. They would have been bloody. And that's really important because as a Jew writing to Jewish believers, what what he has just done is he has given them a picture of the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant. 
which looks something like that. Where once a year, the Jewish high priest would come in and sprinkle blood on the mercy seat where those linens would have been between the angels, one at the head, one at the feet. And God would look down at the blood and he would, that would atone for the forgiveness of sins for the people of Israel. Hallelujah. There's a uh, clip too on, on, um, on YouTube, the, uh, there's a guy who's an archaeologist mm -hmm. and he reveals that where the ark was, uh, was many feet below where Jesus's cross was and the blood actually dripped down through the rock. Have you seen this? Extraordinary. Mm -hmm. This is powerful cat. But you know yeah. that the blood was on those linens at the very least. I mean, so there you have the sprinkling of the blood, <clears throat> sacrifice of Jesus between the two angels. God looking down from heaven would have seen it the way he, the way he saw the mercy seat. And only John includes that detail. Why would he do that? Yeah, it gives me the chills too, Ginger. That's why I like it. <laughs> he was He's eyewitness. pulling it all together. Yeah. <clears throat> And he was there. I mean, that are right. we, am I interpreting this right? He was there. <clears throat> the others weren't. So he's there. Like if, if I see something that's incredibly significant to me and I get it, like what I'm actually seeing, that's going to be the detail that I tell where if the other people are like, Oh my gosh, he's not here. There's angels. You know, that part might've been lost, but he possibly understood, right? Cause he was at, the Passover he was in all of those places where he he heard <sighs> okay like if he heard Jesus all you know he got that he saw him dip the the bread in the blood and he heard him say this is my body this is my blood so maybe this is one of those examples where the Holy Spirit gave him the whole picture all at once because That's he was true. there That's yeah very he was true. there but as a Jew when you're hearing a description of the mercy seat you're thinking presence of God. That is where God sat in the Holy of Holies. And if you're trying to make the point that Jesus is God, that's a pretty strong picture. Mm -hmm. That is a very strong picture to the Jews. To give them encouragement that no matter what they're facing, Jesus is God. He is one with the Father. The presence of God has just been reenacted in the tomb. So this is, so as you're looking at the gospel narratives, and we're going to have to go ahead and close up here. As you're looking at the gospel narratives, kind of get in the habit of who's the author, who's the audience, what's the purpose, and start looking for those details, those emphasizing points, so that you can pick up on the things that the author intends for you to pick up on and learn about the kingdom of God that comes in power, that Jesus is one with the Father, that he is the true king and the true Messiah that the Old Testament has been prophesying about. We get to learn all four of these things all at the same time, and it's just a ton of fun. So. Fascinating. Okay, I'm going to have to let you go there. So powerful, Kat. Very powerful. Kat just, that, that, that's my... So much. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much thank you. awesome all right well i will put up a pdf of my slides again as usual i'll also put up the link to that um that bible project video on gospel so you can see that you can see even how the the hebrew corresponding word shows up in the old testament so it's a very old concept um and it's just we tend to think about it in christian terms so i'll put both of those uh, up there tonight before I head out. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. And congratulations Thank you. again on your new son. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> my daughter is married to this Oh, wow. Congrats. Yeah. Well, y'all have a good night. Thank you, Kat. Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye. Bye. Bye.